a privilege to be in such august company. It was the 14th century Dutch reformer Erasmus who said, the main hope of a nation lies in the proper education of its youth. A very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker for today's prestigious Dayanand Sagar University Foundation Commemorative Lecture 2021 on the role of Dayanand Sagar University in building a vibrant India. Padma Vibhushan Sri N. R. Narayan Murthy, founder and chairman emeritus Infosys. A man who amidst all his great achievements says, and I quote, a clear conscience is the softest pillow in the world. I would also like to welcome Dr. D. Prem Chandra Sagar, our honorable pro-chancellor, Dayanand Sagar University, Bengaluru, a true visionary leader and brilliant entrepreneur in whose wise steps we taking Dayanand Sagar University to greatness and also recognize the presence of Dr. K.N.P. Murthy, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Dayanand Sagar University, Bengaluru, Shri K. Jairaj IAS, Advisor to the Board and Member Board of Governors, Dayanand Sagar University, Bengaluru, and Dr. Kincha, Education Evangelist for Dayanand Sagar University. Warm welcome to the other dignitaries in the panel, deans, directors, principals, faculty, staff, students, ladies and gentlemen, who have logged in, in this, this morning to be part of what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating lecture. May I now request Dr. Sagar, Honorable Pro-Chancellor, Dayanand Sagar University, Bengaluru, for his opening remarks and welcome address, please. Thank you. Sir? Good morning, everyone. I am extremely honored and feel privileged to welcome Shri N.R. Narayan Murthy to the Dhyanan Sagar University Foundation Commemorative Lecture. This lecture is extremely important on two counts. One, first it is being held when we celebrate the 100th birth anniversary of the founder of the, of the, of the Sagar group, my late father, barrister Dhyanan Sagar, a true visionary. Two, we have in our midst in Sri N.R. Narayan Murthy, a man who exemplifies the best of human values and leadership. Dayanand Sagar University is a young university with a great legacy of over six decades. It was established with a vision to provide quality higher education to all those who aspire for such education at an affordable cost in a nation that is desperately in need of such institutions. The university has in a very short space of time established fields of study in various areas ranging from applied sciences, arts, design and humanities, business, engineering, health sciences, journalism and medical sciences. Dr. Chandrama Dayanand Sagar Institute of Medical Education and Research has in a short period created a safer environment for several thousand people staying in the rural areas of Ramnagar district by providing affordable health care. We are very proud that the university is at the forefront of nation building by providing an opportunity for our young men and women to receive an education that is second to none. It is our ever dream that in the days to come, this university will be counted as one of the aspirational places of education in the world. It is not a misplaced idea. India till about 400 years ago was the shining beacon of education for much of the civilized world. However, we are in a country so rich that it can explore the space and launch missions, but still has hundreds of thousands of citizens who can't read. That's troubling to me. As we grow, it is our dream to integrate education vertically from primary education to a post-doctoral one, where liberal arts will mesh seamlessly with logic and science and creativity will abound at the cusp of several areas of study. At this university, we are cognizant of the changes occurring in the industry, like artificial intelligence, automation, robotics taking root, 
and the rapid digitalization of the world, which have caused us to re-examine our curriculum and pedagogy in several areas. COVID-19 has accelerated this transformation and in many ways pushed us to innovate. Governments are keen to help their citizens develop in these areas, but it is hard to devise curricula and the best learning strategies without being precise about the skills needed. It is difficult to teach what is not well-defined. Our administrators and professors are seized of the need, just as the industrial revolution in the 19th century drove an expansion of access to education, we are aware that as an university, we need to use the technology revolution for ambitious expansion to ensure universal high quality access to education from childhood to retirement. That is our commitment. Even as we dwell on education and technology, my mind harks back to the brilliant case study from the Harvard Business School, Infosys in India, building a software giant in a corrupt environment. The events in the case are enthralling as they display singular leadership, courage, and self-confidence from the man who is here with us today, Sri N. R. Narayan Murthy. Our former president, Sri Abdul Kalam said, and I quote, the purpose of education is to make good human beings with skill and expertise, unquote. That is the ethos of this university. As I conclude, I would like to recall the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great philosopher who said, do not follow where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path and leave a trial, unquote. That best describes our founder, Barrister Dayanand Sagar, and our guest, Sri N.R. Narayan Murthy. I, I would extend a very warm welcome to our beloved guest, Sri N.R. Narayan Murthy, and all uh, uh, the dignitaries and all the invitees who have uh, joined in today's session and who are very eager to listen to a very inspiring address by our beloved uh, 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 guest, Sri N.R. Narayan Murthy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, and uh, for those wise words. Uh, may I now request uh, Mr. K. Jairaj, IAS, advisor to the board and member board of governors, Dayanand Sagar University, Bengaluru, to introduce Mr. Narayan Murthy, please. Thank you, Captain. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Sagar, Pro Chancellor of the Dayanand Sagar University, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Kincha, esteemed faculty, students, and invitees. I am honored to introduce Sri N. R. Narayan Murthy, who has been my mentor, dear friend, exemplar, and associate for over 30 years. Welcome Sri Narayan Murthy to this gathering. It is impossible to introduce you in five minutes, but I'll try to do my best. Mr. Narayan Murthy, or NRN as he is affectionately called, is universally recognized as a business leader and visionary of the highest standing. NBC ranked NRN among 25 top global leaders at position 13. He is also recognized as an entrepreneur who founded Infosys, unarguably India's finest corporate entity. Fortune ranked him as among the 12 greatest entrepreneurs of our time. Similar recognition has also come from Ernst and Young. But why he is important is because he perfected the global delivery model, which was the backbone of India's software industry and which has made India what it is in the world of software. And this has also provided employment to millions of aspirational Indians and others in the world who look to Narayan Murthy as a savior. You may be interested to know that the Infosys journey began in 1981 with Mr. Narayan Murthy and a few 
co-founders putting 10,000 rupees and starting a software company in what was then an unchartered domain. Today, the rest is history. Infosys recently reached a market cap of 100 billion US dollars and has annual revenues of over 14 billion dollars. What is very important is that as a business leader and as head of Infosys, Murthy always stood ahead of the curve. And a few examples may be important for our young audience. He has believed, perhaps for the first time in corporate India, that wealth can be created ethically. And also it is the obligation of leaders who do so to share it with all others engaged in the enterprise. He pioneered the ESOP concept in India by which equity was made available for employees. Infosys was the first company to be listed from India on, on the NASDAQ. And he has followed all through his life the highest ethical values in personal conduct as also the norms of corporate governance. I cannot think of any other founder CEO who stepped down from leadership of a company at the age that he did. And finally, he pioneered the 24 hour work day. Lest you all think that Murthy was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, the reality was very different. He hailed from a lower middle class family with his father being in the education department and the large family having to depend upon one income. So he was educated in official government schools in Srinivaspur, Madhugiri, Mandya, and Mysore, to name a few. He was a ranked student in SSLC and PUC. He studied at the National Institute of Engineering, Mysore, and obtained a BE in electrical engineering, and later a master's in computer science at IIT Kanpur. So yesterday I asked him, why didn't you enroll at uh, IIT, uh, which you could have walked into uh, for a BE? And his answer was that, you know, there was a cash flow problem at home. I got a national scholarship, but that scholarship was given only at the end of the year. And so my father suggested that rather than finding so much money, it is better that you study in Mysore. But what makes him really the man that he is and what he has done is I saw that in evidence when I had the privilege of working with him in setting up the Bangalore International Airport, which is India's first greenfield project in the airport sector. And what I observed in him and what is true of what in, happened in Infosys was unwavering commitment, clear vision, and what Dr. Ram Charan describes as execution excellence in whatever he does. Secondly, clear leadership and a very hard taskmaster. And to complete the picture, a warm and compassionate person in building relationships with others. As Captain Nagarat Subarao mentioned, Mr. Narayan Murthy has received the Padma Bibhushan Award. He has also received several other national honors. He has served on the boards of the great universities of the world, such as Yale, Cornell, Stanford, and now is with the Institute of Advanced Study, Princeton. And he has also been a member of several other major corporate boards of the world. I had a problem yesterday in trying to summarize this introduction uh, in the short time that was available. And I asked him, so, sir, what do you want me to emphasize? And he said the following. I am a Kannadiga and proud to be one. I have tried to give my best for the country. I have achieved much more than what I deserve. And I have always focused in my work on trying to do more than what I have promised. So that is Mr. Narayan Murthy. And it is very fitting that today he should deliver the DSU 
foundation lecture and over to you mr narayan murthy thank you thank you sir thank you thank you to dairaj i must say that dairaj uh, of course is a close friend and we form a mutual admiration society it became even clearer today with yet another data point chancellor the pro chancellor the vice chancellor the pro vice chancellor captain professor kincha shri jairaj other members of the board of governors principals deans faculty staff alumni students and guests i am indeed honored to speak today at the foundation day event of this promising institution a few years ago i had the opportunity to address a similar event elsewhere after all the purpose of my lecture today is the same as the purpose of my lecture that i delivered then therefore i will use similar ideas even in this lecture i will speak on why we should enthusiastically embrace a grand vision for this institution to become a top quality university in science engineering law medicine liberal arts and a few other things that you may have in mind there are many excellent books written on creating great universities the one i found most useful is a book presented to me by my son rohan untitled the great american university its rise to eminence its indispensable national role and and why it must be protected the book is written by professor jonathan cole a former provost of columbia university you may want to read this book you may also want to read speeches by the legendary professor derek bock the much respected former president of harvard university Let us first trace the history of modern universities. I am proud of Nalanda and other great institutions of learning of ancient India. However, I should not be philopietistic at this time. I sh- should acknowledge that the credit for creating a modern university goes to the united states of america not the uk not germany and not india nalanda was indeed the first teaching university it flourished between 500 ad and 1300 ad bologna founded in 1088 AD in Italy is perhaps the oldest surviving teaching institution oxford founded in 1167 AD in the uk and cambridge founded in 1209 AD in the uk formed the model for harvard college founded in Boston United States in 1636 AD Harvard started teaching with just 9 students 
It was followed by the College of William and Mary in 1693, Yale in 1701, Princeton in 1746, and King's College, now called Columbia University, in 1754. The Morgan Act paused in 1862 allocated up to 90,000 acres of federal land to each state in the United States to start what are termed land-grant collegiate institutions to import instruction in agriculture and mechanical arts to the students, sorry, to the children of the working and middle class folks. The idea of a university originated in a set of nine lectures given by the English Cardinal John Henry Newman in Dublin in 1852. However, most experts in education opine that Newman's idea was limited to that of a college and not a university. The idea of a university took birth in the United States by combining the task of transmission of knowledge, which is the hallmark of the Oxbridge tradition, with the task of creation of new knowledge propounded by the German tradition of research, exemplified by Wilhelm von Humboldt and the University of Berlin. The first US university to focus on research as its primary objective was Johns Hopkins University that was founded by Johns Hopkins about a hundred years after the founding of the US in 1776. The model of the American Research University was established by five colonial colleges chartered before the American Revolution, that is Harvard, Yale, Pennsylvania, Princeton, and Columbia. Five state universities in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, and California, and five private institutions conceived from their inception as research universities in MIT, Cornell, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, and Chicago. According to Roger Geiger, a distinguished researcher on the US education system. It is noteworthy that six out of these 15 gold standard educational institutions or land grant institutions and have been performing as premier research institutions. California, Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin are in the public sector. Cornell and MIT are in the private sector. You must dream of making DSU one such university. DSU should lay the foundation for seeding observation, curiosity, discussions, questioning, openness to new ideas, analytical and critical thinking, meritocracy, pluralism, independent thinking, self-confidence, understanding real world phenomena, applying formal theory learned in the classroom, and solving real world problems right here in Karnataka and India. DSU should provide an environment of deep thinking, imagining the unimaginable.
unimaginable and unimagined discussion, debate, collaboration, focusing on unraveling the deep secrets of nature, interdisciplinary approach to problem solving, and data and fact orientation among many other aspects of research. The objects of a university like DSU are twofold. First is to guide the students to reach the frontiers of knowledge in any branch of science, engineering, medicine, law, social sciences, and arts through Socratic style of questioning, teaching, and practice. Some of these successful students will go into the real world and apply the knowledge acquired in their education at the university to make life better for the world. Some of you students will take the second path, which is to focus on what the Germans call Weisenschaft, or knowledge for its own sake. Experts believe that the undisputed leadership of the U.S. University is due to the successful symbiotic integration of both the teaching and research models. Some of you will perhaps wonder why you should bother about knowledge for knowledge's sake. Why should you worry about fundamental research at DSU? That is a fair question. Being an engineer, I will use examples from science and engineering, primarily physics and engineering, in my talk today. But what I say holds good for every inquiry into the unfathomed in every area of human knowledge. Let me elaborate. Science is about unraveling the secrets of nature and understanding reality. For example, your physics classes must have taught your students answers to questions like why the sky is blue, why an apple falls, what is the physics behind a magician vanishing an elephant in a cage right on the stage, why an open window appears dark when looked at, at it from the outside during the daytime, why the air feels cool in winter even though the sun is shining brightly, can an astronaut enjoy Shreya Goshal singing in front of him in space? Does a gallon of coal gasoline give more mileage to your car than a gallon of warm gasoline? Why an AM radio station fades out when your car goes under a bridge while your FM station does not? Why you cannot see an earth rise and earth set from the moon, how to make a rocket roar into space, why you cannot boil water in space, why ice skating is harder to do when the temperature of the ice surface is very, very cold, why the laundry hung on a clothesline dries top down, is it possible to cool the air in the kitchen by keeping the door of your refrigerator open at home? Why parachutes have at least one went home? Why current day aircrafts of commercial airlines recirculate much more air than they did during the previous decades? Is it a smart design to have a stainless steel handle for a metal tea kettle? And why squinting helps a myopic person to see more clearly? Notice that every one of the questions that I have selected 
is all about our daily life. That is the purpose of physics. These questions make our life more comfortable. They help us understand the secrets of nature and overcome the constraints. My young friends, to me, this is science. Engineering is about applying science to real world problems to remove constraints of nature and to make life more comfortable for human beings. TV, telephone, computers, motor cars, air conditioners and refrigerators are some examples of engineering applying scientific knowledge to solve real life problems. Let me remind you the words of Edward Teller that the science of today is the technology of tomorrow. For those of you somewhat skeptical about the use of fundamental research, I must say for some of you who are still somewhat skeptical about the use of fundamental research, let me give you some examples of how mankind has benefited immensely from fundamental research. Quantum theory invented by Max Planck, Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, Max Born, Paul Dirac, Werner Hasenberg, Wolfgang Pauli, Erwin Schrodinger, John Bell, John Clauser, and Richard Feynman is what has made transistors, lasers, nuclear energy and DVDs possible today. It is fair to say that we would be back in the 19th century without quantum mechanics. The theory of relativity enunciated by Albert Einstein in 1905 and approved by him, sorry, improved by him in 1950 is what makes today's global positioning systems accurate. Without this celebrated theory, our GPSs would be off by seven miles. I don't know how many of the youngsters know this. PET scanners that doctors use right here in Bangalore use Einstein's famous equation e equal to mc squared for their working. Without the work of Kurt Gödel, Alenzo Church, Alan Turing and John von Neumann, we would not have had computers that are so ubiquitous and so essential to our existence today. Without the celebrated theories of James Maxwell and Claude Shannon, the world would be a dark and disconnected place. Let us remember the apocryphal words of Michael Faraday, the inventor of electricity. When asked by William Gladstone, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer of Britain, what use electricity was to Britain, Faraday is reported to have said that Gladstone could indeed one day tax it. For those of you interested more in reading about how fundamental research could be useful, I would suggest you read the book the Usefulness of Useless Knowledge by Robert Flexner, the founder of the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. It comes with a companion essay by my friend Robert Digraff, the current director of the Institute. This book is about the power of fundamental research in making life better for humanity. Therefore, we must overcome our skepticism 
about the so-called useless knowledge and encourage our youngsters to pursue fundamental science enthusiastically. It is perhaps appropriate that we follow the British chemist and Nobel laureate George Porter, who called such research not yet applied research. We want our youngsters to understand that these most scientific theories were enunciated when these extraordinary scientists tried to understand the hidden secrets of nature. Why is it important for our youngsters to learn fundamental science, applied science, and engineering? Wherever you are sitting, this is a virtual conference, so therefore you would be sitting in your room or at home, wherever it is. Just look around your room. You will get the answer. Electricity, light bulb, fan, air conditioner. If some of you have a projector at home, the projector, you would have a microphone in, on your laptop. And of course, your laptop, all the products of independent thinking, critical thinking, and research in science and engineering. Let me give you an example from my own life. I take a flight to go from Bangalore to Delhi. I take a car to go from Delhi airport to the hotel. I listen to music on FM in the car. I call my secretary in Bangalore on my mobile from my hotel room in Delhi. I watch TV and see what is happening in the world sitting in my hotel room in Delhi. Every one of these came from science and engineering. And they were all invented outside India. Our youth deserve to invent some stuff valuable to India and, of course, the world. They deserve to contribute to this world so that they too are recognized and respected. Else, what is the contribution of a nation of 1.35 billion people to this world? Look at our own history of advances in just music, literature, philosophy, science, and mathematics. I've taken on just five areas. There were many composers, writers, scientists and mathematicians who did earth-shaking work during the golden period of science, philosophy, and mathematics in India between 180 and 1480. Tyagaraja, Purandara Dasa, Shankara, Ramanuja, Madhva, and Basavanna belong to this period. The scientists and mathematicians of the golden era of Indian science and mathematics were some of the most original thinkers of the world of that period. Arya Bhatta, who lived between 476 AD and 550 AD, produced Arya Bhatiya, his most influential work of that time, and introduced ideas on planetary motion, quadratic equations, simultaneous and indeterminate, indeterminate equations, the area of a triangle, the shape of the earth, and the cause of day and night. Brahma Gupta, who lived between 598, AD and 665 AD enunciated the rules to compute with zero, the rules to compute squares and cubes of integers, 
and the rules for dealing with fractions. These were revolutionary ideas at that time. Bhaskaracharya of Bijapur, who lived between 1114 AD and 1185 AD, whose work in calculus predates those of Newton and Leibniz, is another illustrious role model for our children. Madhava, who lived between 1340 AD and 1425 AD, demonstrated the power of his original thinking in using infinite series for approximate computation of some trigonometric functions. There are many more. I've just taken a few examples. The conclusion is that our youth of today is capable of original thinking if we create an environment that encourages such adventures of human mind. There are even more important reasons why our youngsters must be encouraged and equipped to become contributors to solving huge problems that confront us every day. Our huge population is a big burden for providing our children, basic education, health care, nutrition, and shelter. The Human Development Index, or HDI, uses just three parameters. They are life expectancy index, that is, life ex expectancy in years at birth, the education index, that is, the expected years of schooling, or college at birth. And finally, the income index. That is, this index is one when the per capita GDP of a nation is US dollar 75,000, and it is zero when it is just $100 US. In fact, these parameters, in effect, tell the whole story of how a nation is developed the health of its citizens, their productivity, their education levels, their accomplishments, and their contribution, the success of a nation's education system, its healthcare system, and the nutrition levels of its children, the standard of living of its citizens, its industrial and employment systems, and its adoption of modern tools of progress by its citizens. It is widely used, as many of you know, all over the world to measure how well a country is progressing in making the life of its citizens better. Incidentally, HDI was developed by the much respected Pakistani economist, Dr. Mahbub ul Haq. India has remained around 130 in the HDI ranking of nations among 193 nations in the world for most of the last five years. This is obviously something that we cannot be proud of. We have huge problems in almost every area. We are ranked even lower than most South Asian countries and most African states in public health. Our primary education is in a very sorry state. PISA, that is the Program for International Student Assessment, is a set of tests conducted under the aegis of OECD. PISA ranked India 72nd out of 74 countries that participated in PISA in 2009. What did India do to improve our position? The government of the day stopped participating in it. It is sad. 
our agricultural productivity is low compared to developed nations our ports are inefficient our cities are polluted the slums in our societies in our cities are increasing due to migration from rural areas to mega cities in search of jobs the traffic in our cities as all of you know is unmanageable traveling from one part of the city to the other part is a nightmare well let me stop here and just say we have huge problems now what is the solution i believe that we can find appropriate solutions to our problems if we educate our youth to think independently to find scientific and technological solutions to our problems that is the primary objective of a modern university dsq can lead the effort in transforming the mindset of our youth from reactive problem solving to proactive problem defining and problem solving our youngsters enter your, uh, your university as intelligent curious enthusiastic and energetic young men and young women dsu's responsibility is to transform these fertile minds to leave your university as confident knowledgeable open minded objective and independent thinkers that are raring to go after the solutions to the problems of our country if dsu can become one of the top 100 universities in the world in the next 50 years i believe that the dream of every one of us assembled here would become a reality your challenge as seniors of this venerable institution is to dream plausibly impossible dreams and work hard to make them happen can dsu produce a manu a kautilya a ramanujan or a cv raman will one of the dsu students become another purandara dasa can one of the dsu students reach the philosophical pinnacle of a basamanna or an akka mahadevi can dsu produce another literary genius like kuvempu shivram kharand sl bhairappa or triveni can a dsu student become another kalingara or a ks narsimha swami can a dsu student find a vaccine to chikungunya or a dengue our son has been producing 4 million tons equivalent of energy i mean that's a lot of energy if you use the equation e equal to mc square what i gave you is m there see the velocity of light then you can compute <laughs> the the energy you know it produces for it produces 4 million tons equivalent of energy every second using nuclear fusion not nuclear fission nuclear fusion because hydrogen atoms fuse to become helium and lose a little bit of uh mass that gets converted to energy and, and sun has been doing it for over 5 billion years out of this i don't know how many of you know only 4.5 pounds equivalent of energy reaches our earth every second 
Now, even more surprising is that the entire set of human beings need just 44 pounds equivalent of energy every day for all their needs. What it means is that we just need 10 seconds of the energy we receive from our sun for the daily needs of the entire humanity. Can a DSU student devise a method to use solar energy more efficiently and ex less expensively? Can he or she produce an inexpensive method for nuclear fusion to produce energy? This is a huge problem. Can GSU students find an inexpensive solution to desalination of seawater? Can they improve the productivity of our farmers by a factor of 10? Can they find an inexpensive solution for purification of our polluted air? Can they devise a non-invasive solution to measure blood sugar levels and non-invasive tests for detecting certain kinds of cancer that require biopsy today? Can they devise a cure for cancer without chemotherapy? I believe this has just been announced in the UK. I read it in, the, in one of the journals yesterday after I wrote this page, this, this speech. Can they find a solution to predicting a drought a few months in advance to help our farmers? Can they find an inexpensive but strong concrete that will help us build roads to withstand the wear and tear for 100 years so that we can print, we can prevent all these potholes in Bangalore? Can they find solution to India's other pressing problems? My friends, these must be your dreams and this must be your resolve today. If the DSU youngsters can accomplish solutions to some of the problems and aspirations that I listed, then they would have brought back pride to our people our country and to our future generations like the scientists, mathematicians, surgeons, philosophers, and physicians of the golden period of Indian science did between 180 and 1480. Can we hope that an Indian youngster educated in DSU will grow up to make a mind-boggling discovery like Niels Bohr, who postulated that the location of an electron becomes certain only at the time of observation, and that the inherent nature of reality is fuzzy. Will a couple of your students contribute to science like a little-known Irish Theorist John Bell, whose mathematical vision combined with the ingenious design of a complicated experiment of a graduate student by the name of John Clauser, proved that Niels Bohr and the mathematics of quantum mechanics were right and that Albert Einstein was wrong. Can we produce another Kumar Avyasa? Can DSU produce scientists like Ashok Sen, Ramanujan, Siena Rao, and Satyendranath Bose? Can our youngsters educated entirely in India and doing research in India emulate Amartya Sen, Chandrasekhar, Haragobind Kurana, Abhijit Banerjee, Venki Ramakrishnan, Akshay Venkatesh, and Manjul Bharga? It is DSU's charter to produce such thinkers and creators and be part of this transformation of India. This is the sacred oath that you must take on this day. This can only happen if DSU becomes a university 
like one of the golden universities of the US and the developed world. The elders of this university cannot shirk from their duty to enable DSU to convert this aspiration to reality. What kind of university should DSU be? I would like it to be an expression of an age as well as an influence operating upon both the present and the future. As Abram Flexner, the founder of the Institute for Advanced Studies once said, such expression of new ideas will indeed unsettle traditional thinkers and they will definitely try to scuttle such intellectuals. You should derive strength from the words in Ecclesiast, the book of the Jewish Ketuvim, and the Old Testament published more than 2,300 years ago. It says, I quote, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. I want DSU to be a place where new thoughts and new ideas emerge often, sometimes leading to the emancipation of our society with new discoveries and inventions. Discovery is seeing what everybody has seen and reasoning what nobody has reasoned, as Albert Gairobi once said. Invention is creating what nobody has yet seen. Folks, achieving this will require lots of competence, courage, commitment, and character. You need to help your youngsters seek truth no matter how bitter it is. Let us remember the words of Rolf Waldo Emerson who said, and I quote him, the universe is the externalization of our souls, unquote. This task of making DSU a globally renowned institution, known for seeking truth, can be achieved only by those that have the courage and persistence to focus relentlessly, relentlessly on your goal despite great odds. I believe that DSU has such leaders to take it to great heights. My best wishes to every one of you on this important day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. That was indeed a fascinating lecture. I'm sure that your insights have been very impactful. It's important to recall that the foundations of useful knowledge originate in the exploration of useless knowledge. Wonderfully said, our youngsters must be contributors in solving huge problems. And as Emerson said, the universe is a reflection of our souls. May I now request Dr. K. N. B. Murthy, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Tainan Sagar University, to deliver the vote of thanks, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Captain. Honorable Chief Guest, of today's event, Honorable Pro Chancellors, other dignitaries on the panel, the officials of ESU and DSI, invitees, faculty, and students. Dianan Sagar University, established under Karnataka Act 20 of 2013, started its academic operations in the year 2015 by making its foundation, by marking its foundation. To remember this foundation, we organize annual commemorative lecture by an eminent personality. This year, we are very fortunate to have Sri Narayan Murthy, the founder of Infosys, who has been a role model for many of us. Delivering this year's foundation lecture on the role of DSU in building a vibrant India. Sri Inaran, who is fondly called, he has demonstrated that 
we can walk the path of success through honesty, dedication, as well as commitment to work. This lecture was delivered at a time when DSU is trying, trying to position itself as a university with a national character and global outlook. The message from our chief guest is a powerful, action-driven, passionate message. Sir, we are all honored as well as privileged to listen to you and your inputs in this lecture have given us a path, of, path for making a paradigm shift and assure you that we will work on the inputs sincerely and honestly. So clearly indicated that we need to look at problems within our locality, within our country, and try to find solutions for each other. Sir, on behalf of Dhanan Sagar University, management, staff, and students, we sincerely and gratefully thank you for making time amidst your busy schedules to deliver this lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Hemachandra Sagar, the Chancellor of this university in absentia, Dr. D. Premachandra Sagar, the Honorable Pro Chancellor of DSU, for his gracious presence, welcome, and opening remarks. I recognize the presence of our board members, Madam Tintisha Sagar, Ms. Rogan Sagar, our secretary, Sri Galiswami, Sri Janardhan, the Pro Vice Chancellor, our DSC Evangelist, Ms. H.P. Kincha, and advisor K. Jairaj. Sir, we submit our thanks to all the invitees who responded to our invite and to attend this lecture. Our thanks are also due to the heads of DSI groups of institutions, Dr. Putmadapa, the registrar, Anita Ramalingam, the control of examinations, all our deans, the chairpersons, faculty colleagues, non-teaching staff, students, and finally, we submit a book of thanks to everyone who attended this lecture, who got the, the real message that we need to adopt in the education institutions to make the institution a powerful one or a useful one to the society. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sirs. We, are, we will conclude uh, this webinar now and a good day to all of you. Thank you. Thank sir. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you.